Welcome to our webinar, Research Advancements in Vision Restoration and Neurodegeneration. My name is Tom Bruner, and I'm the President and CEO of Glaucoma Research Foundation. Catalyst for a Cure is Glaucoma Research Foundation's leading research program. This unique collaborative model has uncovered groundbreaking results for the glaucoma and medical world. Launched in 2002, the first team of investigators changed the understanding of glaucoma from an eye pressure disease to a neurodegenerative disease, revealing the possibility of new therapeutic approaches. The second catalyst for a cure, the Biomarker Initiative, identified novel indicators of disease, enabling clinicians to detect, measure, and treat glaucoma with unprecedented precision. In 2019, in partnership with generous donors, we launched the Stephen and Michelle Kirsch Catalyst for a Cure Vision Restoration Initiative. Leveraging discoveries from the first two CFC teams, these four investigators have shown extremely promising early results that may lead the way for new genetic, neuroprotective, and cell replacement therapies. A fourth initiative launched in 2022 is the Melza M. and Frank Theodore Barr Foundation Catalyst for a Cure initiative to prevent and cure neurodegeneration. It breaks new ground by supporting research into multiple diseases, seeking knowledge and solutions that could affect all neurodegenerative conditions. Today, we will learn more from two of our accomplished Catalyst for Cure principal investigators, Ana Latore from the Vision Restoration Initiative and Humsa Venkadesh from the Prevent and Cure Neurodegeneration Initiative. Dr. Ana Latore attended the University of Barcelona in Spain, where she received a master's in cell biology and a doctorate in neurobiology. Today, she is an associate professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Human Anatomy at the School of Medicine at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Humsa Venkadesh received her undergraduate degree in chemical biology from the University of California, Berkeley, and her PhD in cancer biology from Stanford University. Now, she is an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Both are amazing scientists, and it is an honor to have them with us to share their Catalyst for a Cure research. Anna will speak first, followed by Humsa, after their presentations, we'll discuss their research and respond to some of the submitted questions. Anna, please go ahead. Thank you so much uh, for the very nice introduction. And uh, thank you everyone for joining in. Um, as Tom mentioned, I'm part of the third team of the Catalyst for the Cure initiative. And today I want to tell you about the latest developments of um, the work that we're doing together with the team. Uh, but before that, I want to give a little introduction so we're all on the same page about what we're trying to do and what cells we're gonna be talking about. So of course, this is a depiction of an eye and as probably everyone knows, vision starts when light enters the eye. When that happens, oh, sorry. Uh, when that happens, light um, is perceived by this tissue at the back of the eye called the retina. And that's what the ophthalmologists looked at um, when they see patients. This tissue, the retina, is made by different types of neurons, including photoreceptors. These are the cells that can perceive the light um, and other types of neurons. But all this surface that we see here is covered by very special cells called retinal ganglion cells. These cells receive all the information that's processed by the retina and are the only connection 
between the retina, between our eyes and our brains. These cells, um, we can see here a real image of how we see them under a microscope. Um, here they have been stained with a special technique. Uh, so we can see their bodies, these are the round bodies, and these sort of cables, we call these axons. So which one of these cells on this surface um, have these axons? Um, and so what happens when light enters the eye is that it's processed by the retina. These cells, I only show one, but it's a whole mosaic of these beautiful cells all over the surface. Uh, these cells capture this information and then the information travels through these fibers. Here you see a picture from the front of the eye. Each one of these dots is one of these retinal ganglion cells. And hopefully you can appreciate that each one of these cells sends these cables, these axons towards the center of the eye, the region called the optic nerve head or the optic disc, where all these cables bundle together and these, uh, by doing that, they form the optic nerve. So the optic nerve really is made by a part of the retinal ganglion cells. And the optic nerve is how this um, information from the retina travels all the way to our brains, where the visual information is processed and where we really see things. So what happens in glaucoma? I showed you that the retina is covered by this beautiful mosaic of the retinal ganglion cells that then send their processes, these cables, towards the center of the eye. What happens in glaucoma is that a stressor, this can be, for example, increased intraocular pressure, the pressure inside the eye, um, or other um, stressors, uh, adds damage to these, to these cells, and they slowly degenerate. These axons, these fibers start to break down, start to die, and that damage the optic nerve first, and then slowly these cells will die. This is a progressive disease, so it happens over and over and over, and as more and more cells die, uh, that's what leads to vision loss, uh, because our retinas can no longer connect with our brains. So, um, when that happens, when a patient has glaucoma, what can we do for them right now? So as we speak in 2023, the only option that we really can offer patients is ways to lower their intraocular pressure, this uh, 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 eye pressure that is often elevated in patients. And that works, um, and many patients really profit for that, but not always. And actually 50% of patients never have elevated eye pressure. So clearly what we can offer patients right now is not enough. So uh, with the Catalyst for a Cure initiative team as well and many others, uh, we're trying to develop novel therapies uh, so we can offer better solution for vision loss in glaucoma patients. There's three different approaches that can be taken the first one, it's called neuroprotection. And as the name suggests, this is aimed at protecting the cells um, and avoiding uh, the death that, and the damage that happens when there's a stressor in the eye. We try to preserve what's there. Um, however, this solution can only be used if the cells are still there and uh, the, the disease can be diagnosed at a fairly early stage. Um, then there's a second option that we can take, and that's called uh, regeneration. And that's aimed at uh, when the cells are starting to die and the axons have started, these fibers have started to degenerate, can we rescue them? Can we make them healthier? And can we get these fibers to regrowth and reconnect with the brain? And the final approach that one could take is cell replacement. This could be used when the cells are dead, they are no longer dead, vision loss is already happened. Can we somehow introduce new cells and reestablish the connection between the eyes and the brain? Um, of course, time uh, will dictate which one of these approaches is better. 
And um, with our team, we are not really limiting ourselves to just trying one approach or another. We are really exploring this breadth of options uh, for different patients. So I'm gonna tell you first about the latest developments in this front, trying to preserve uh, vision. So uh, this is the team, the four of us, and together we're trying to develop strategies to both preserve vision and restore vision when there's been vision loss. So I mentioned that in the retina, there's these cells, the retinal ganglion cells that connect the eye with the brain through these fibers, these axons. Um, but these cells are not just one type of cell. They're not homogeneous. It's not a single thing. Uh, several um, published works have shown that actually there's many types of these retinal ganglion cells. There's actually 45 different types and they differ in many ways. They express different molecules that have different sizes. They connect differently with both the retina and the brain. And what us and others have found is that not all these different types of retinal ganglion cells respond equally when there's a stressor in the retina. So what I'm showing here in these different columns is different types of retinal ganglion cells the first column show all retinal ganglion cells. That's why there's so many here. And then this uh, column shows one particular type of cells, the alpha cells, different type of cells, different type. You'll notice that some of them are smaller. Some of these types, there's, there's more cells than other types, but each one of these columns show one particular type. The first row shows these cells in a retina that's healthy. And then the second row is what happens when there's been damage, there's been uh, induced intra elevated pressure in these eyes by injecting silicone oil. And what happens four weeks after uh, there's been a stressor in this eye. And you probably can appreciate that some of these populations there's a very quick decline. So this is one example. There's many cells here in the healthy eye, but after there's been a stressor, many of these cells die very quickly. And we see only a few of these cells just one week after the damage has happened. In contrast, some other populations like this one, there's not that many cells to start with in the healthy eye, but after damage, we don't see that much of a difference meaning that these cells are pretty resilient and they pretty unbothered when there's been a stressor in the eye. And so one of the questions that we ask together with the team is why is that? What do these cells have that make them more sturdy, more resilient? And can we use that? Can we use some molecular tricks that these cells normally use to be resilient? And can we make other populations like these ones Brazilian now. And so that's what we did um, using some molecular tricks. We identify molecules that are uniquely expressed in the population of retinal ganglion cells that are Brazilian to damage. We identify one of these molecules is called osteopontin or SPP1 as a key molecule to provide resilience uh, for damage in these retinal ganglion cells. So here, I'm showing you that one population that seemed to be pretty sturdy and pretty resilient in control, meaning healthy eyes and after damage. And we see that there's not a big difference. These cells really don't die, don't get damaged very easily. However, when we take the same population of cells and we inhibit, we block this one molecule, SPP1, now these cells start to die. And this is quantified here. Um, with damage, these cells really are not affected that much. But when we block this one molecule, now these cells die very quickly. And the opposite is also true. Now we are looking here at one of these populations that die very quickly. So here we have the control situation where this is the healthy eye here. And this is what happens just um, after we induce this silicone oil, this elevated eye pressure. And we see that many, many of these cells die very quickly, and this is quantified. However, when we take these cells, cells that are normally pretty sensitive to damage, 
and we introduce this one molecule as PP1 osteopontin. Now we can make these cells sturdy and we can make them uh, resilient to this damage. And so uh, these uh, results uh, were very exciting for us. Um, but this is not the first molecule that we identify as a potential neuroprotector. And in the past, um, we have published other molecules, and this is one example where, you know, th this is a control eye, healthy eye. This is what happens after uh, damage happens. So many of these beautiful retinal ganglion cells die. And this is what happened when we introduced a different uh, strategy. This is called MAP4K4. It's a different molecule. When uh, we inhibit this molecule, now we have this nice protection tool. So we have not just one or two, but several molecules that seem to be pretty good at protecting the cells from damage. And so what we are trying to do in the next, uh, we're doing right now, and we, we want to do in the next few months is to do combinations. We want to know what is the best combination of molecules that provides the maximum survival and the maximum protection for the retinal ganglion cells. Um, and so this is one of the directions that uh, we are uh, going as a team. But as I said before, neuroprotection strategies are great um, if there's something to protect and if some of the retinal ganglion cells are still there at the time of the intervention. What happens uh, patients that have already a significant degree of visual loss, can we do something for them? And so in that case, because there's the cells, the retinal ganglion cells have already degenerated and there's no cells to protect, we need to come up with a different strategy. We need to come up with a way to put new cells in that eye and create some strategies so these cells that we introduce reconnect with the host eye. And so the first thing we need is some cells to be able to transplant. Uh, luckily, uh, many labs, including mine, have stem cells, and we know how to um, so uh, generate these cells and culture these cells in the lab. Stem cells are very similar to the cells that make up embryos when we are just starting life. And of course, embryos can make everything. They can make hearts and livers and brains and eyes. And uh, through techniques that were discovered about 20 years ago, now we can make cells that are very similar to the cells that make these embryos from any cell in the body. In the lab, we make them from skin biopsies. We can just take a small skin biopsy, grow the skin cells in the lab, and we can reprogram these cells so they become very similar to the cells that make up this early embryo. And if we provide these cells, these stem cells with the right instructions and the right molecules and conditions, we can direct these cells to make retinal cells, including retinal ganglion cells. And so the retinal ganglion cells in these uh, pictures are shown in green. We make what's called mini retinas in a dish or organoids. And we have these three-dimensional structures that uh, slowly and over time generate retinal ganglion cells. Not only these cells, uh, we can make them in a dish in the lab, but these cells also extend these cables, these projections that are so crucial to connect the retinas and the brain. Um, I don't want people to get the wrong impression that these are like some sort of eyes that we have. These are really small. Uh, this is uh, the size of the these organoids or these scalminous retinas, they're really small and they're limited in size. They don't have vasculature, they don't have blood supply, so we cannot grow them um, more than, than what you see here. And one of the issues that we have with these cultures, we can make the cells, which is very exciting, but we also know that if we keep these cultures for a long time, these cells can degenerate in a dish uh, and they can degenerate. And so that would not be a good strategy. If we have cells that are sick to start with, probably that's not a good source for a transplant. And so I showed you that before, together with the team, this is uh, um, some experiments that were led by Dr. Derek Wellsby. We identified some molecules that seem pretty good at protecting neurons, at protecting the retinal ganglion cells in the eye. 
So we ask, can the same strategies and the same molecules protect the cells and keep them healthier as we make them from um, these stem cell organoids? And the answer is yes. When we have these control organoids, we have retinal ganglion cells. Uh, this is how they look. When we treat them with some of these molecules, not only we have a lot more of these cells because they're surviving better, but we also see that they're better at extending these axons um, in, in, in the dish. And so at this point, we have healthy cells that we can use for transplantation. And not only these neuroprotective treatments are useful to keep the stem cells alive and healthy longer in a dish, but they're also very promising when we introduce cells in the eye and we introduce them together with these drugs, we can get the cells to survive way better in a, in a transplant, in, a, in an eye. And so these are two examples of cells that we transplanted, we made them in a dish, then we took them, they're labeling green so we can see what's happening to them, and these are just two examples. And this is, on average, the amount of uh, transplantation that we get. And this is what happens when we introduce these neuroprotective strategies. And hopefully you can appreciate that there's way more cells surviving in the eye. So this is all really promising and we are very excited, but we know that we have another challenge that we need to overcome. Um, the challenge is that while these cells that we introduce and we can transplant, can survive in the eye, very often they do not connect with the retina. And so these are two examples where this is the retina. We are looking at this, uh, this is uh, a live eye. And we see a lot of these cells that instead of moving inside the retina are staying in the vitreous, in the cavity inside the eye. They can survive there, but if these cells do not connect both with the retina and with the brain, they're really not doing anything there. And so what we are working on right now with our team is to try to improve the integration of the cells that we're transplanting. And we know that the eye, the retina, has a natural barrier. It's called the inner limiting membrane. And it's really a barrier that protects the retina um, from the rest of the eye. And so, um, we are exploring if chirurgically removing a little bit, making some breaks into this barrier can improve the integration of the retinal ganglion cells. And the answer is so far, the results have been really promising. This is a, an eye where we introduce some of these cells and you see there's some, uh, but they're quite sparse. When we had one of these breaks, chirurgically, we uh, remove a little bit of this natural barrier in the eye. We see a lot of better transplantation. And not only we see more cells in this one spot, but now some of these start to integrate and start to connect with the rest of the retina. So we're excited to continue this, uh, but all the data that I've shown you so far has been done using host um, eyes that are healthy. And of course, that's not a, a clinical trial. That's not something we want to do. We want to assess what happens when we introduce these transplants in an eye that's sick. And there's an ongoing problem, and some of these endogenous retinal ganglion cells are dying. What's going to happen in those conditions? And uh, we are exploring some of these models. So now we have the perfect setup. So we can really um, ask the question, what would happen when we try to do these transplants in a situation where many of the eye retinal ganglion cells are uh, actively dying, are sick? Can we restore uh, these cells and can we restore these optic nerves? And so uh, these are some of the future directions we are going. And uh, with that, I'm gonna end my talk here. I want to uh, let my colleagues speak, uh, but I just want to thank everybody who's uh, participating in the research, all the people in my lab, and especially, especially my uh, team collaborators, uh, Dr. Yang Hu, Dr. Derek Welsby, and Dr. Uh, Shin Duan. Um, thank you very much.
All right. That was wonderful, Anna. Um, thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. Um, lots to look forward to, I think, in the treatment of glaucoma. And you guys have made some wonderful headway um, and certainly a beautiful introduction um, to um, a lot of the work that we are doing. Um, so firstly, um, again, I would like to echo um, Anna's sentiments um, and thank not only the Glaucoma Research Foundation, but all of you uh, for being a part of the foundation and for being here as well to um, listen to some of the some of our updates. Um, so our team is um, titled uh, the Initiative to Prevent and Cure Neurodegeneration. And so more than just uh, glaucoma, our, our team is actually focused on thinking about mechanisms that might be applicable to a number of different types of uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And so with that, I want to uh, start by just introducing the team to give you a um, an overview of all of us um, so you can see what distinct expertise we really bring. Um, Sandro de Mesquita is a uh, wonderful neuroimmunologist um, who focuses on um, a number of different neurodegenerative diseases uh, and largely Alzheimer's models. Uh, Milica Margheta is a um, wonderful clinical ophthalmologist and really brings a huge expertise um, in the clinical arena of uh, glaucoma. Karthik Shaker um, is a um, computational biologist um, with an expertise in um, bioinformatics, which, as you will see, is pivotal to um, a lot of what we are working on. Um, and I um, am a cancer neuroscientist um, that uses a lot of these different neurotechnologies um, and systems neuroscience tools um, to study um, brain cancers. And so together, as you can see, we have a very wide array of expertise, um, but I think this is a really unique team because what it's allowing us to do is not only harness the resources of, of all of our individual teams and um, expertise, but I think we really share very different perspectives that are really allowing us to approach this idea of shared mechanisms between neurodegenerative diseases um, from a very unique place. So as you can see here, this is a picture of uh, the optic disc, as Anna had described, in glaucoma on the left, um, and a picture of an Alzheimer's brain on the right. Now, what's really interesting to note is that despite the fact that these are very clearly distinct pathologies with very distinct hallmarks, they're both marked by this idea of neurodegeneration and this idea of neuronal death. Now, that's very interesting because what we can think about is that there are likely shared mechanisms and a shared milieu and shared support cells surrounding these neurons that might give us a hint as to what we might target. And that may lead to therapies that are useful to not only glaucoma, but also other diseases, also number of different Alzheimer's diseases or multiple sclerosis models, Parkinson's models. I think there's a lot to be learned by comparing these different types of neurodegenerative diseases, which is really the goal of our group. So just as an example here, what I wanted to illustrate is that these nerves, as you can see here, are these huge prevalent cell types, both again in the retina in the context of glaucoma, but also in the brain in the context of Alzheimer's or cancers or any type of neurodegenerative disease you can think of. But these nerves are typically surrounded by a number of these different support cells. And so here, what you can see is that there are indeed, there are oligodendrocyte cells, which are support cells. There are immune cells, which are protective cells. There are, of course, uh, the endothelial cells that comprise the blood vessels. Um, and there are also, um, you know, multiple different types of other, um, you know, glial support cells involved. And so what we really want to think about is thinking about these diseases from a much more holistic perspective, as opposed to solely considering the nerves in the context of neurodegeneration, we really wanted to think about the microenvironment, what we call the microenvironment, which is all of these different support cells that are involved in neurodegeneration and how they might be interacting or communicating to lead to these different pathologies. And so our hypothesis has really been that these different central nervous system pathologies, as I had mentioned, share very common cellular and molecular mechanisms that may indeed um, serve as therapeutic targets that alleviate um, disease progression. And as you can see here, in the past uh, several years, there has been a huge amount of literature that really suggests that these diseases are indeed diseases of the microenvironment. 
And there have been these various different gene signatures that are associated with very specific cell types across these different disease pathologies. And so there have been a series of studies that focus on either the oligodendrocytes in disease pathologies or immune cells in disease pathologies or astrocytes in these disease pathologies. And what's been very clear is that in addition to these neurons, there are these other glial subtypes that we very inherently need to consider in order to holistically piece together what might be going on in these various different contexts. And so now that we know that these, um, that, you know, there are a number of studies focusing on the neurons, our angle has been to think about these different intracellular communication pathways that occur in areas surrounding these neurons that we might be able to um, harness. So overall, the, our experimental overview, as you can see here, is to compare models between glaucoma, Alzheimer's disease, as well as glioma, which is my area of expertise. But the unique thing about what we are doing here is really that we are studying all of these various different uh, cell types. So as opposed to these past studies that have focused on single cell types alone, uh, we are focusing, uh, we're taking a large bioinformatic approach to study astrocytes, endothelial cells, uh, microglia, as well as oligodendrous oligodendrocytes um, across different disease models and across different anatomical locations. And so we're not only studying the retina, but we're also studying the optic nerve as well as the brain. And one thing I would like to mention is that CFC1, as uh, Tom had mentioned, is a um, was a group that made huge progress in the context of glaucoma and really taught us that glaucoma is indeed a neurodegenerative disease. And that in addition to dysregulation within the eye, there was indeed dysregulation within the brain. So again, this tells us that we need to consider this disease as a central nervous system uh, malignancy, and that we can think about, um, you know, holistically speaking, what aberrations are going on in multiple different locations and across these different diseases. Now, as a, as a um, storytelling mechanism, I want to use glioma as an example. Now, we are interested in glioma largely because in addition to these neurodegenerative diseases that we're studying, we can think about glioma as being a neuroproliferative disease, so somewhat on the other side of the spectrum. And I use glioma as a model system here to tell this story, largely because there are several studies focused on specifically studying cancers. As you know, it's a very well-studied disease. And there have been lots of studies, especially using these single cell sequencing technologies, but they have largely focused on studying these malignant cell populations individually. Um, Otherwise, alternatively, in addition to these malignant cell populations, they have chosen either immune cells or either these astrocyte cells or these blood vessels to study in isolation. But the unique thing that we are attempting to do is really study these different cells at the intersection um, and to query all of the cell types at the same time, again, across these disease models and to understand how they may be communicating. And our hypothesis is that we may see dysregulation of shared pathways, but that in neurodegenerative diseases, we may see some specific signaling pathways or specific interactions uh, dampen, whereas in gliomas, we may see the opposite effect, where we see the same mechanisms being upregulated, um, just tipping the scales in opposite ways. Um, and so I think it's a really exciting time to really um, think about, you know, how we might uh, start to address these various different diseases by assessing them all together. So particularly in the context of glioma, what we know is that gliomas are extremely heterogeneous. And there have been a lot of uh, studies now pointing to the fact that there are these uh, reactive astrocytes, these reactive immune cells, as I mentioned, these blood vessels, these neurons. And what's very clear is that uh, more than just a single cell type needs to be interrogated, and that this intracellular communication between these different cell types may indeed be critical. And so just to give you a sense of what we are able to do with some of these single cell sequencing technologies, I want to tell you a story about what we were able to do with these glioma cells. What's very clear is that when we sequence these tumor cells, what we found is that there was a huge upregulation of these neural gene expression cells in the tumor cells themselves. 
And that suggested that somehow there was this plasticity occurring, that these different cell types were in fact affecting one another to upregulate and express these varied gene expression programs. And so what I'm showing you here is this upregulation in this specific population of these malignant cells that are enriched for these neural gene expression programs. And that led us to this very interesting hypothesis where perhaps, next, perhaps there were indeed direct communication pathways and direct synaptic integration occurring between these malignant cell types and their neighboring neurons. Now, typically, we only think about normal neuron-to-neuron -neuron synapses, so neurons only firing and propagating their signal to neighboring neurons. And in that way, they have this electrochemical communication that tells the brain what to do, that tells the eye to receive cues to allow us to see. But here, what we were hypothesizing was that these tumors were actually hijacking these same mechanisms and integrating with neurons in their microenvironment to derive cues that may inform their progression. And so what we found is that using electron microscopy, there were indeed a number of these prevalent synaptic structures in our tumor tissue. And as you can see here, there's a very clear synaptic cleft with a postsynaptic density in that presynaptic bouton that suggests that these tumor cells were indeed receiving direct electrochemical neurotransmission. We then were able to use and repurpose neuroscience Again, what we were seeing with these neural gene expression patterns and using this electron microscopy to perform whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology. And what we found is that a subpopulation of these tumor cells were indeed um, demonstrating um, uh, these excitatory postsynaptic currents in response to this neural activity. And <clears throat> indeed, what that allowed us to see is that these tumors are, in fact, electrically active tissues. And using two-photon calcium imaging, what we were able to see, as you can see on this slide, is that these tumors are have a huge electrical component. So everything that you are seeing here is indeed ion flux and electrical currents that's flowing between this malignant tissue or this tumor cell tissue. Again, these are properties that we typically only associate with neurons, but we know now is a fundamental property of cancer pathophysiology. And I bring this to your attention largely because all of this was derived and we were functionally assessed by using these single cell sequencing technologies to probe what potential interactions these tumor cells were having with aberrant cells in their micro environment. Now, this has been very exciting space to work in, largely because now what we know is that there are opportunities for clinical treatment. And because of this newfound knowledge that these tumors are indeed electrically active, there are a number of groups that are currently working very hard to repurpose these neuromodulatory agents, these already existing neuromodulatory agents for the purposes of these brain cancers. So we now know that we can target these synaptic interactions between neurons to neurons, the uh, synaptic interactions or these bona fide synaptic interactions between tumors and neurons, as well as all of this downstream membrane depolarization and ion flux that occurs specifically within these malignant tumor populations themselves. And I'm really pleased to say that um, direct um, work, um, direct uh, evidence from this work has now led to an ongoing clinical trial for the treatment of both pediatric as well as adult gliomas. And I think there are soon more to come. And so with this in mind, our idea is that we should harness the power of these sequencing technologies very similarly, not only to these um, cancers, but largely and more widespread to this, these neurodegenerative diseases. And in terms of the bioinformatic analyses that are required to, uh, you know, to bring these together. Um, it is quite, um, you know, it is quite an intensive process, which is why I think having Karthik Shaker on our team, who again is a phenomenal bioinformatician, is going to be hugely helpful. And just as an example, I wanted to put up here, um, you know, again, another example of these different types of interactions that occur in the microenvironment. This is a study that looked at the T cells or the immune cells in a number of different cancer types. And so despite the fact that these are not the same cancers, this group 
group was able to harness and integrate these data sets from the brain, from the skin, from the breast, from the pancreas, from the prostate, and look at the T cells specifically in all of these different tissue types in the malignant context and find shared commonalities and shared pathways that may be prevalent for all cancers. And so this is an approach that we are trying to apply, again, in the context of neurodegenerative diseases and apply our single cell sequencing technologies to study a number of different types of diseases. Now, this is a really unique model, largely because these microenvironmental components of these disease pathologies are very rarely comprehensively studied in the context of um, either cancer or these neurodegenerative or um, different types of CNS pathologies. And whenever they are, again, as I mentioned, we're only really focused on one specific cell type or one specific model. And as you'll see, what we're actively working on um, over the past year, our team has been together for um, only about a year so far. But what we're doing is using, um, harnessing the power of all of our individual preclinical animal models together with the data that we each um, have collected, as well as publicly available data sets on human patient tissue to try to integrate all of these data sets and generate data sets of our own, where we can collectively look at how we can address these different, different and shared pathways uh, that might be integral for these different disease progression. And so we are actively working on really understanding the common transcriptomic signatures, um, as I mentioned, in the retina, in the optic nerve, and in the brain of different models of uh, glaucoma, brain amyloidosis, uh, primary tauopathy, as well as in glioma. And later on in our studies, what we're really going to be focused on is, as I mentioned, uh, as we were able to do with glioma, was really functionally validate these, uh, these hits and really use these different orthogonal assays to understand how we might use what we learn to either uh, prevent um, or restore these various different cognitive function in these disease models. Now, to begin, as I mentioned, we have so far looked at multiple different models um, of both neurodegenerative and neuroproliferative diseases in the brain. Um, and excitingly, what we're able to do is uh, use single cell sequencing and sorting. And so what that means is that we can take the tissue from these disease models and we have the technology to isolate these various different cell types in a very specific manner um, and look at the gene signatures of these individual cell types. And so we can cluster these cells based upon their, uh, their profiles which, and allow us to define whether or not these are immune cells that we're looking at or astrocytes that we're looking at or oligodendrocytes that we're looking at or nerves that we're looking at. And that gives us single cell resolution. And so we can see um, at the single cell uh, level, what might be going on at the individual cell level and between these cells in the intercellular communication axes. Now, in the brain, that has turned out to be quite easy, as there are a lot of studies that have focused on single cell sequencing in the brain. Um, and we have beautiful data now really understanding and recapitulating uh, the separation between these immune population, these glial cell population, as well as in these um, neuronal cell populations. Um, this has been relatively straightforward to do in the brain, and we're already starting to get some wonderful data really understanding how these different intracellular communication pathways are, are working in the brain. Um, and now we're actually off to optimize in the context of uh, the retina. Um, as you may or may not know, um, in glaucoma models, it has been, um, you know, historically very difficult to perform these uh, single cell sequencing studies. Um, however, a landmark paper um, just came out this year that, again, um, Karthik Shaker, one of our team members, has been a part of um, that really lays out this idea of being able to do a very um, reproducible single cell sequencing on the retina that we are now recapitulating. And again, Melitza Margetta is really leading the charge on our, on our team. And so I think we're off to a great start, really understanding how we can look at all of these different microenvironmental cellular interactions in the retina and optic nerve as well. Now, I also just wanted to uh, mention that in addition to these um, 
to these mouse and preclinical models that we are actively working to develop um, and get data on in our own in this very systematic and methodical way, we're also leveraging the power of these publicly available data sets. Um, and so there are a number of groups, as I have mentioned, that have looked at these individual cell types across these different disease models. And though they may not have, they may not look at across all of these different um, cell types, what we are able to do now, again, using these very complex uh, computational methods, is integrate these data sets so that we're able to um, you know, put them all together and see whether or not just using already existing data, we might be able to identify these shared or different pathways that are important for these different diseases. And this gives us a really important parallel measure of really understanding what our data is telling us. And I think that's been very exciting because for the first time, um, and this is uh, data from Karthik Shaker's lab, what we're able to do is look at these different, um, you know, existing data sets and map onto them. Them, these different cell types, as I mentioned before, we're able to use their publicly available data and identify these different subpopulations very clearly, which now gives us uh, the power to then move forward um, and integrate these data sets and look for these um, common uh, pathways. And so moving forward, as I mentioned, I think in the next year or so, we're going to have a lot of uh, really important analysis of our um, existing as well as newly generated data, um, where we have methodically looked at all of these different cell types across these different models and across these different central nervous system anatomical regions. Um, and the goal is really to start functionally validating them, to really identify ways where we might mitigate disease progression, um, depending upon the specific um, model, a neurodegenerative model that we are working with. Um, and so I think that it's a really exciting time where, as I mentioned, um, you know, with all of our different various um, expertise and resources, we're really taking a unique approach to understanding these uh, large, this large number of diseases. And the hope is that we'll be able to come up with um, therapeutic targets that are effective for a number of different diseases moving forward. And so with that, again, I would just like to mention, particularly in the context of glaucoma, this idea that this is really a holistic and systemic disease where we need to think not only about what's going on in the, in the retina or in the optic nerve, but also perhaps what's going on in the brain. These are pathways that are highly interconnected, um, and we really need to think about this largely holistically. And I think a lot of our work is really going to be looking at, again, these various different interactions um, at the local level. Level, but also at the systemic level that's going to give us a handle on um, treating this disease in a way that may not only treat, you know, the local um, in, uh, inflammation and high pressure, but also the systemic potential cognitive, um, you know, debilitations that are associated with these diseases. So with that, I'll just end um, by thanking, of course, the Glaucoma Research Foundation, first and foremost, for giving us the opportunity to take such a um, high risk approach to understanding these various different diseases. And of course, um, all of those that are involved on our team and our team members, um, and all of you, of course, for your generous support. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Anna and Humsa. That was fascinating. You both did such a great job of making this very complicated work that you're both doing um, somewhat understandable. And um, thank you for that. We do have... Uh, a lot of questions. And I think the first one that is on everyone's mind and is the hardest one to answer uh, is when do you think we may actually see your work coming to fruition where we might actually be in a position to prevent or to cure blindness from glaucoma? And I'll just add, and from these other neurodegenerative diseases as well. But I think many of our participants today are particularly interested in glaucoma. So um, I don't know, would either of you care to comment a little bit? Is, it, is the time frame 100 years or 10 years or five years or what What, what are we talking about? I, I'll get started if that's okay. For sure, not 100 years. Good. <laughs> For uh, the neuroprotection strategies, um, I think we are in a really good position um, 
And I think in the next few years, I'm talking less than five, we'll have clinical trials for some of these molecules. Uh, the data is fantastic. It looks really good. We know now how to keep some of the cells alive for a long time. And so I'm, I'm quite positive about this aspect. Mm -hmm. The cell replacement strategy, that's a harder one. Um, and I don't want to say a time frame because it's hard, it's not a hundred years, but there's many challenges that we need to overcome. We can make the cells, which is a fantastic first step. We can transplant the cells and keep them alive in the eye. Uh, but now comes the biggest challenge, which is getting the cells to connect properly. And that's crucial. We don't want something connecting improperly. Um, and so we need to figure out the strategy to get the connection both with the retina and with the brain correctly. And so my opinion is that that will take more work and we're looking at a few more years down the line, probably. Okay. And I don't want to speak for, the, for the other diseases. <laughs> No, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, um, Anna has already shown some really exciting work that, you know, suggests that there might be some really exciting uh, strategies that we might think about just in the next few years. Um, I think, you know, moving forward, thinking about um, other mechanisms of, of treatment for both glaucoma and um, neurodegeneration, um, I, I still think, you know, it's within the realm of 10 to 15 years, we might see some huge improvement in how these diseases are being treated. And I think what's really exciting, and as you could see from even just the, the little bit of data that we showed, I think, you know, the advent of these very new technologies are, uh, is really helping our cause. You know, the brain initiative really allowed us to get all of these different, um, you know, technologies about imaging and assessing and uh, recording and stimulating um, neurons. Um, and I think that has been typically used in the context of understanding normal function and normal behaviors, normal cognitive outputs, and is now starting to be used for the purpose of these different disease models and neurodegenerative diseases and cancers. And so I think that's actually going to lend us to have a lot more insight in the next uh, few years, uh, very excitingly. And I think that will probably translate into the clinic between, you know, 10 to 15 years. I'm very excited to see where the field moves. Well, it is certainly interesting, the, the, all that's happening today and all the new technology you have and just the relationship between the different diseases of the central nervous system, if you, if you will, the neurodegenerative diseases. And um, I just wonder, Humsa, as you know, uh, and, and both you and Anna have participated in a Catalyst meeting where we brought both teams together this past August, and there was great discussion among the eight scientists uh, about the different work that you're all doing. How do you feel um, the, about the benefits of, of maybe the, the, the place where Anna and that team is uh, today and what they've accomplished as how can that help even maybe to accelerate the work comes so that you and your team are doing. Hmm. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> question. You know, I think our team is actually, um, you know, learning a lot from Anna's team, especially because, you know, their team, as I mentioned, is really focusing on these RGCs and really on the neurons themselves. Our team is largely focused on understanding what else can we do in the microenvironment that can support these cells. And so I think there's actually a lot of synergy in the context of, you know, regeneration and protection, because again, you know, these cell intrinsic mechanisms may be a part of it um, in the neurons themselves, but I do think that these support cells um, that are there are inevitably can certainly enhance anything, any strategies that we're using to either do for res restoration or, you know, protection. Um, and I, I don't, I don't know, Anna, if you have any, anything else to, to add to that, but I think it's like, there's lots of synergy there and I see us all collaborating in the very near future. <laughs> well, it certainly is interesting that some of the earliest work on glial cells was actually done, um, by Monica Vetter and her team in the CFC one and those and showing the earlier exactly. activation of, if you will, of glial cells that then corresponded with loss of retinal ganglion cells in, in a model of glaucoma. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm almost thinking that maybe some of the work HMSA, your team is doing oh, absolutely. this communication could benefit uh, Anna and, and their team as well. So I, I see this, it seems to me really as a very much a two-way 
street. Uh, any thoughts on it? I absolutely agree. It is absolutely a two-way street. We are already collaborating with some of the CFCF food. And so we definitely benefit from them and their expertise. One of the beautiful things and interesting things about this initiative is putting people together with very different expertise and points of view. And so my team, you know, I feel we had slightly different points of view and expertise. The CFC4 is very wide <laughs> uh, points of view. And the, that allows us to really think outside the box, the box of glaucoma, the box of ophthalmology that we are trained to think about. And so having them um, really pushes us to think broader and um, think from different perspectives. So, yes. So one more question, uh, Anna. Since you're actually cl close to clinical trials on neuroprotection, could you comment on what, you know, how will you know who would be a good candidate for a clinical trial? Are there some things that, that would take people out of being candidates for uh, clinical trials on neuroprotection? Um, so I don't think there'll be things taking people out. Uh, I think an ideal candidate would be somebody at sort of intermediate stages of the disease, maybe some vision loss has happened, uh, but there's some vision that's uh, still preserved. And I think that would be important because if we are uh, talking about patients at very late stages of the disease, when a lot of the vision is already lost, uh, then these, these strategies won't do much. Um, in terms of eye pressure or other factors, I don't think, um, any of those factors would exclude patients from this type of, of triads. Well, that, that's that's good to know. And I, I think it's uh, it's important. So I, I'm looking at the time here and I just think we're, unfortunately, we're sort of out of time for questions, but it's been wonderful to hear uh, your responses. And I want to thank you both so much for making the time to be with us today and uh, certainly all your preparation and your dedication to glaucoma patients and glaucoma research, and certainly uh, to neurodegenerative research. And I certainly also want to thank our participants for your interest and support, without which none of this would have happened. Um, if we were unable to answer your questions today, do visit our website, www.glaucoma.org, for the latest information about glaucoma and our research. And don't forget to mark your calendars for June 28th and 29th, 2024, for our sixth patient summit in Philadelphia. You can go to www.glaucoma.org slash summit for more information. Thank you once again for being with us today and for joining us in our bold vision of a future free from glaucoma. Because of your continued partnership, the cure is truly in sight. See you next time.